Well, hey, Rocky River Church, Jimmy and Karen Britt here. And uh, we just wanna say that we love you guys and we miss you. We hope that you're safe and that you're doing well. We also wanna welcome you to Rocky River Church online. We also wanna give a shout out to all of our kids and our youth. We love you, we miss you and hope to see you soon. That's right. And just a couple of other things as we get started today. One is uh, we'd love for everyone that's watching right now, everyone who's connecting with us at Rocky River Church Online, fill out a connection card. And uh, if you're a first time guest with us, the connection card just gives us a way to get to know you while you're getting to know us. And you can find that connection card at the top of your screen if you're watching from a laptop or a desktop type computer. If uh, you're watching through your smartphone or a tablet, then you'll see a drop down menu. Then also let me encourage you to download your message notes. And uh, again, you'll find those right there around uh, the screen. And uh, those message notes I think are important, not just because I'm the preacher, but I think they're important because it gives you the scripture passages and uh, also some fill in the blank type notes. And it just helps you to get uh, to be a little more engaged and get the most out of today's service. And then finally, let me thank you uh, for being faithful with giving your tithes and your offerings. There are several way to give, uh, ways to give. One is uh, through text. You can see that link on the, um, on the screen. You can also give safely and securely through our website. And of course, you can always mail in your tithes and offerings. But we want you to know that everything that's given, no matter the size, it's really important. And uh, again, we thank you for your faithfulness as uh, we do all that we can to reach people with the gospel of Christ here in our community and around the world. So once again, God bless you. We're glad you're here. And now let's worship together. Dark. 
that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is alive, forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness
Well, hey, Rocky River Church, once again, it's great to connect with you guys today. I hope that wherever you're watching from right now that you're safe and that you're doing well. And uh, if this is the first time you've ever connected with us at Rocky River Church or we just haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name's Jimmy. I'm the lead pastor here at Rocky River and uh, welcome. And sort of the way we say it usually is uh, whether you're a first time guest, a long time member or somewhere in between, uh, welcome. We're just really glad that you're here today. If you have a Bible with you or near you, open it up or turn it on. Go to the book of Genesis Genesis chapter 9, and uh, as you may know, we're in a series right now, a teaching series called Origins, where we're just walking through and unpacking the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, and eventually we're going to make it all the way through the book of Genesis, but uh, right now, uh, we're just in the big setup. We're breaking the book of Genesis up into different teaching series, and these first 11 verses really tee up everything else, uh, not only in the book of Genesis, but in the rest of the Old Testament and uh, the Bible as well. Now, we're at the part of the story in Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 11 where we're dealing with the flood, so Noah and the flood. And uh, today, I think this is, um, now th- chapter 9 is on the back side of the flood story, but I, I think this is such an important part of the flood story. And let me explain to you where we are and and maybe that'll help you understand why this is so important. So the flood has happened. I mean, creation has been virtually wiped away. And Noah and his family were on the ark for over a year. And now the floods have stopped and the water is receding, it's gone back far enough that now Noah and his family can get off the ark. And that's what they do in chapter eight. They finally get off the ark. And can you imagine how good that must have felt? I mean, they've just been stuck on this big, you know, water vessel for all this time. And now now they're finally off. One of the very first things that Noah did when he got off of the, the ark is he built an altar and offered a sacrifice to God. And in that sacrifice, he was doing two things. First, he was saying, God, thank you for protecting me and my family. Thank you for keeping your word. Thank you for saving us through this horrible, uh, very scary flood. And the second thing he was saying to God is, I am completely and totally yours. This was Noah's way of... uh, just saying again to God, I am all yours. And that's going to be really important because what happens in Genesis 9 is the restart happens or the recreation. I mean, the really tough work of starting over really sets in in chapter 9. And now here's something that's important. Before anything else happens, I mean, before Noah and his wife and and his family members, and by the way, there are eight of them, including Noah, before they can set up temporary housing, but before they they put up a, 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 a tent type covering for them to sleep under, God gives them four instructions about life. And these are four key instructions in four key areas of life. And what he's doing, I think, is he's making sure that this recreation, this starting over, gets off on the right foot. He wants Noah and his family to have the right understanding or the right attitudes toward life. Now, while God is speaking to Noah and his family, you need to know that this is not just for Noah and his family. I mean, it's given to them first, but ultimately these are instructions, these are attitudes, these are actions, these are practices, these are things that go from one generation to the next. L- literally, 
these instructions, these life instructions are for every generation, every person, every age, and they are not to be ignored or amended. Th these are permanent instructions for how we are to view life now. These are not necessarily easy things. They're basic, they're foundational, they're fundamental, but they're not necessarily easy things. And today as we unpack Genesis chapter nine, verses one through 17, uh, I'm gonna give you these life instructions as we go along. So uh, I'm ready to jump into Genesis chapter nine. I hope you are. Are you ready? Say yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Genesis chapter nine. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And right there is where we find our first life instruction. And here it is. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write it down anyway. Life must multiply. Life must multiply. I mean, life is supposed to grow. Life is supposed to happen. And God begins with the instruction to Noah and to Noah's family, I want you to multiply. And, and that makes sense, right? I mean, because here's Noah, here's his family. They're, they're off of the ark. And essentially what they have is a, a blank canvas. And they're a part of the restart. And a part of that restart is not just about shrubbery and putting in lawns and that kind of thing. It is about multiplying. It's about populating or replenishing the earth. And you know, if you look back through history, I think we've done that. Um, you know, we fulfilled this command. Um, I think from the days of Noah, the time period that it took to reach a billion people on earth uh, was from the day of Noah until I think 1804. I mean, th Think, think about that. That's centuries and centuries. That, that's thousands of years to go from eight people to one billion. Well, since 1804, we've added another 6.8 billion people to that number. The estimation is that there are 7.8 billion people today on planet Earth. So I, I think we've gotten that part right. And I know that some people, when they talk about the population of the earth, and sometimes you hear scientists talk about it or sociologists, they talk about the overpopulation of the world. And I, I'm just going to tell you that that whole thing of overpopulation, you just don't even find that in the Bible. That, that's something that, um, that overpopulation and dangerous levels of population explosion that is something that people say who have an agenda where they want to control the population for their own purposes. And hey, j just, just, just to say it, that's not anything new. I mean, you can go back to ancient cultures, whether it's the Romans or the Greeks or all the way back to the Egyptians and, and even before them, you can see how those people governments, those classes of ruling people wanted to control the population, but it was never about the people. It was always about their control. And I'll just throw this in since I'm uh, maybe preaching at you a little bit. It, it, it's about, it, it's, it, it's about paganism. Every, every people group, every government throughout history that has wanted to control the population, they have pagan roots. Um, controlling the population is something that people talk about in countries where people don't govern themselves. God told 
human beings from Noah all the way to today multiply and replenish the earth. Now, l- let me go in just a, a sort of a, a different direction on this. Because I'm going to tell you the kind of people that we need to be multiplying right now. We need to be raising kids and grandkids and, and multiplying people that have a biblical world view. L- let me say it like this. The great commission, the great commission that Jesus gives us in Matthew 28 to go into the world and make disciples has never been more important than it is right now. It's always been important. And maybe it's not more important, but it's never been more important than it is right now. It's important that we, as followers of Jesus, multiply ourselves, that we make other disciples. And when I talk about making disciples, when I talk about Christians multiplying um, disciples, I'm not just talking about people who can tell you where they go to church occasionally or people that have some religious background. We need a population explosion of Christians who are fully committed, growing followers of Jesus. So we need Christians to be committed to following Christ and then committed to living out the Great Commission, which is to multiply disciples. Stay tuned on that. I'm gonna deal with that in a couple of weeks. But for now, the first life instruction is that life must multiply. Verse two, God says, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground. And on all of the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Now, I want you to watch this closely because what what these few verses here, verses two through four are telling us is that some things are changing. Some of the situations are going to be like they were before the flood, but now that the flood is over, some of them are going to change. Verse three, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. See, that's a change. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So what is that all about? Well, one of the things that's changing in this post-flood period is that, well, the relationship between human beings and animals, that, that's what's changing. And so now, instead of, and kind of the implication is that human beings and animals, they've just kind of been, you know, all hanging out together and everybody's buds and you know, everything is great, but that's changed now. Now the animals have a fear of the human beings. And think about why that might be important. Th- that, that's important because, as you know, animals reproduce at a quicker rate than human beings. So if you have animals and humans living right together with each other, it won't take very long for the animal population to outgrow human beings and then things are just gonna be out of order. Because one of the things that you need to understand is that while all life matters to God, everything in creation matters, God gives human beings dominion over creation. Uh, And as you'll see in just a couple of minutes, this, this fact of that human beings are created in the image of God, that comes back up again and animals are important and many of you have pets and you know how important your animals are and uh, you know, I have a little dog at home, his name's Rocky, he's a cockapoo and we love him like crazy. Um, but animals ain't people. And so you can see a little of this division between parts of the creation. And you'll notice this too. One of the things that changes is here in verse three, where God says, everything, everything is gonna now be available to you for food. So the implication of that is that at one time, human beings had a plant-based diet. 
They were not eating the flesh of animals, but now they are. So that, that's a change. That's a significant change. I remember years ago, I was teaching from this passage in a Bible study and a lady who's a, a friend of mine, uh, even to this day, and this has been probably 10 or 12 years ago, she, um, she came, well, actually it was during the Q&A time. She said, Pastor, I'm so glad that you told us that God created human beings to be vegetarians. I said, well, hang on a minute. I, I didn't actually say that. I said, the implication is that one time human beings had a plant-based diet, but I don't think that that was God's ideal from the beginning. She said, well, how, how, how do you know? I said, well, I think the proof is in our mouth. I mean, if you look at your teeth, you compare your teeth to, say, um, the, the teeth of a, of a cow or a horse, our teeth are set up different. You know, a, a cow or a horse that eats grain or grass, they have flat teeth that are good for grinding. I said, but our teeth are more like a wolf. They're made for biting and taking a chunk out and, you know, grinding. Well, not grinding, but, you know, sawing food. I don't mean to be so gross about it, but you, you know what I mean? I mean, we have the teeth of a meat eater. And... She didn't seem to really go for that. And uh, so I said, well, now, one of the things that you need to remember is that all of those vegetarians, you know, they died in the flood. So at least it didn't help them morally. Now, look, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on people who are vegetarians. Hey, I, I won't pick on you for what you eat if you won't pick on me for what I eat. I probably should have more of a plant-based diet. But what I want you to see is that things are changing. The relationship between parts of the creation, specifically human beings and animals, that, that relationship is changing. And one of the things that's similar is that when God says, I'm giving you everything to eat, I'm giving you animals so you can eat their flesh, and I'm giving you the green plants, it kind of makes you think back to the Garden of Eden when God said to Adam and Eve, listen, you have run of the garden. You can eat anything growing in here. You can eat the fruit off of any tree that grows in the garden, which there were probably a lot of trees and a lot of fruit. But you can't eat the fruit that grows on that one tree in the middle of the garden. In fact, the day you eat the fruit from that tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll surely die. Well, here, God is being very generous and he's saying, hey, listen, you can eat anything. You, you can, you have the flesh, you know, things that creep on the ground, you, things that fly in the air, things that have hooks. I mean, you, you can eat whatever you want, but here is the one stipulation. Here is the one no-no and it's in verse four. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And some of you are probably thinking right now, oh no, Jimmy, um, I, I like to eat a ribeye steak and I like to eat it rare or medium rare. You telling me I can't ever eat another um, you know, medium rare steak? No, I'm not saying that at all because I don't think that's what God means. I don't think that's what God is getting at. Let me tell you what I think he means. And this is the second life instruction. Life must be respected. Life must be respected. So the nature of the relationship between human beings and animals, that's changed. What has not changed is that man still has dominion over those animals. But that comes with some restriction. All right, I don't know if there's any way of just talking around this, so let me just say it out. God is saying you can't be like animals and eat an animal while that animal is still alive. Now, I'm not a huge animal guy. I, I like to go to a zoo every now and again. I do like to watch documentaries on animals, just depending on what they are. I love to watch shows on lions, tigers, and snakes, although I hate snakes. Now, the thing about lions and tigers 
is that they will actually start to, um, to eat their prey before the prey is dead. And I've watched, you know, like these, these shows about lions and I'm thinking, please Mufasa, you know, crush the windpipe of, um, you know, your food there, go ahead and kill that thing. It's, it's still crying and, and you're already eating it. Well, that's kind of the way animals do. God says, you're not going to be like the animals. And I want you to be respectful because even though you have dominion over these animals, I want you to be respectful. I want you to be merciful. So like while as human beings, we have full right and privilege to, you know, eat animals, to eat a good steak, we still have a responsibility to treat animals with mercy. Um, we don't have the right to mistreat them and exploit them. We have to look out for them. We have to take care of them. And yes, they are a part of our food supply, but we have to be respectful. You know, I've had the privilege of traveling to different parts of the world. And, and I tell you, I am amazed at what people will eat. Now, to tell you the truth, I'm amazed at what people, you know, just a couple hours down the road will eat. I, I grew up in Charlotte and West Charlotte, by the way, West Side, Best Side. As long as Barbecue King is in West Charlotte, West Charlotte is Best Charlotte. But anyway, um, most of my family is from Eastern North Carolina. And uh, some of the foods that, you know, I've seen on some tables there, I, I can't do it. Hoghead cheese, I can't do it. Uh, chitlins, mm -mm. Can't, can't do that. Um, pickled pig's feet, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just, I can't do that. So I'm amazed at what I've seen people eat here in our own country, but sometimes I'm shocked at what people will eat in, in other places. A few years ago, Karen and I were traveling. We were in Scotland with two of our, our best friends in the world, and uh, it, was, it was day one, and we went to this place. I think it was called the Red Squirrel. We were gonna have dinner there. It was a great dinner. It's a great restaurant there in Edinburgh. We had a, a great meal. But my, my buddy Nelson, he, he decided that he was gonna have some blood pudding with his meal. Now, do you know what blood pudding is? Well, let me tell you if you don't know. Blood pudding is where they take pork blood and some uh, beef broth or beef blood and they boil that with like oats or an oatmeal type stuff and then with uh, something that makes it congeal. I'm, I'm just gonna call it jello, okay? And so they boil it until it congeals, until they have this blood flavored pudding. Then they take that pudding and use it to make sausage. And it doesn't even look good. It doesn't smell good. I have no idea how it tastes. Now, Nelson, he had a bite of it. And then he said, hey, man, you want a bite? And I was like, no way. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And he called me a girl or something like that, you know, wimp or, or whatever. I said, hey, listen, I love the Lord. I'm just, keeping, I'm just keeping up with what the Bible says here. The Bible says to stay away from the lifeblood. But again, people eat what they will eat. But here's what I think the larger point is. God wants his people to respect life, to respect all life. And this whole thing of draining the lifeblood, and I, I promise we'll move on because I know if my mom is watching this right now, she's already walked out of the room and she's saying to my dad, hey, tell me when he starts talking about this lifeblood and this blood pudding stuff. So I, I, I won't stay here very long. But draining the lifeblood out of an animal, it, it, it's, it really brings up two images. One is, like if you're field dressing an animal, like if you shoot a deer out in the woods and you field dress it. And then the draining the blood 
out of the animal is sort of like a blessing, kind of like what you might do before you have a meal. It's a way of saying, I recognize that this animal is giving up its life. That's the life blood because these people are, are ancient people. I, I get that. They don't know a whole lot about biology, but they, they know enough about blood that if you put a stick in that animal, all that red stuff coming out, that's really important. That, whatever that is, that's the life of that animal. And now the life is leaving that animal. And now we're going to consume that animal. And that animal is going to give nourishment and life to me and my family. And so it's a way of saying thank you. And many cultures have done this. Native American cultures here in the United States and in other places, you know, have similar uh, type things where they, you know, actually have their own kind of blessing where they even thank not only their God, but they thank the animal for giving its life. So l listen, it's a way of, of blessing. It's a way of saying thank you, but it's about respect. All right, Jimmy, so m move on from this. I, I will in just a minute. But I think there's something important here to be said about how you and I live in the world. As, as God's people, as Christians, we need to be the kind of people who give honor we should be the kind of people who show other people respect. E even people that we don't necessarily like or people that we don't agree with. We, we should be able to show decency and respect to them. You know, I, I am just amazed. I'm amazed at how mean how mean we are to each other over things that I'm just gonna say I think are stupid, okay? Like, are you gonna wear a mask or not wear a mask? Um, why do we have to end friendships over that? <laughs> it, it's like, well, I can only be friends with people who wear a mask. And I, I'm only gonna be friends with people who think wearing a mask in a store is stupid. Uh, that's stupid to me. That, that's ridiculous. I hear stories about people that uh, unfriend each other on Facebook. Some people have been friends for years and, and now they don't have anything to do with each other and it's over something as stupid as, are you gonna wear a mask or not? I, I just don't think stuff like that is worth fighting over. And I'll tell you this, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's certainly not worth breaking up relationships for and neither is this election coming up either. I'll tell you that right now. But I see the same thing. Oh, you vote for Trump? Oh, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You vote for Biden? I don't want to have anything to do with you. And the disrespect, it's just everywhere. And, and, and listen, we don't have anything to say to people who don't follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't have the right to disrespect other people. I know you're an American, I'm an American, and we have rights, but I'm gonna tell you, our rights end at Jesus' commandment. And what did Jesus say are the greatest commandments? Love God and love other people. And you can't love other people without being respectful toward other people. All right, verse five. And for your lifeblood, now, now he's talking about human beings. He says, and for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting for, uh, from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever, this is verse six, whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, has God made mankind? So here's the third life instruction. Life must be protected. Life must be protected. This is the beginning of human governments on earth. Um, 
it's also where an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth comes from. That, that comes later in the Bible. But it, it's about justice. If you, if you think about it, think about the importance of giving life instruction like this. Human beings to this point don't have a great track record of, you know, treating each other the right way. I mean, it didn't take very long for the first murder to happen. Basically, four pages into the Bible, you have the very first murder. You have a brother, Cain, who horrifically kills his own brother for selfish, ambitious type reasons. And then we see just a, another page or two later that one of Cain's descendants, Lamech, say that name with me, Lamech, just so you can say you've said it today, Lamech. Lamech is bragging about how cruel he's treated other people. And, and in fact, he's bragging about killing a man who, who just wounded him a little bit. And then when you get into Genesis chapter six, uh, I think it's verse 11, where God looks at the world and surmises that the whole earth is covered in violence, that people have devalued life to the point where they're raping and pillaging and, uh, and murdering each other. And again, life just has no meaning and no value. And God is saying going forward in the recreation, people aren't gonna have that view. Now, this is capital punishment. I don't know how you feel about capital punishment. I have some issues with it. But what God is saying is that human beings are gonna take this seriously and that governments have the right and you could argue the responsibility that if a person kills someone out of neglect or out of anger, if it's murder, the, the government of the people, and that looks different at, you know, in different places and different periods of time, it, it looks different for different people groups, but that group of people as a government as a governing body, they have the right and the responsibility to kill that person who's committed murder. And killing that person would not be considered murder. It would be considered justice. It's a God saying, listen, this, this won't end killing and murdering because God's not a fool, right? And, and we know, of course, we see murders all the time. You know, we even create television shows about it. So God wasn't ending murder, but he was ending the way people looked at life. And he wanted human beings to be bent toward protecting humans rather than just killing people at will. And listen, everywhere, everywhere in the world, go back in time, ev everywhere the Bible is believed and preached, everywhere society embraces the scriptures, every life matters. Every life is valued. It's only when a society or when a culture moves the truth of God's word out, which includes that human beings, every human being, whether you like them or not, whether they fit in or not, whether they're so-called good or so-called bad or whatever the case may be, every person is an image bearer of God and every person is valuable. When that is believed by a society, the individual has value. When that's gone out of a society, life loses its value. The age for consensual sex lowers. What's considered rape and not, it changes. Think about Think about every people group just in the last 100 years in this world that have had mass killings. They come from societies 
where the scriptures were not embraced and believed by the people. And so, listen, life in the United States, hey, I think it's better here than it is anywhere else in the world. But we're slipping, aren't we? Why do you think that is? I can tell you why it is. It's really a setup question. It's slipping because we have a mainstream culture that does everything it can to kick God out of our society. And we see that price being paid for it right now. We see it in nightly murder tolls, killing numbers. We see them every night how more and more people in our country lose value. I don't know how that changes. But I'll tell you this, as as God's people, we have the responsibility to protect life. And that starts with valuing life, every life. No matter what color a person's skin. In fact, I'll just tell you that one of, the, one of the most horrible things to happen in this country has been over the last few decades how we have divided people up more than ever before. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. said something like, I have a dream that one day my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And now, it seems like that's all that matters. Except now, we don't even just break society up by white and black. It's yellow, it's brown, then it's different ethnicities, because if you're black, you're African-American. If you're white, you're Euro-American or you're an Italian-American or you're this American. You're something different. And, and the more we're divided up, the less like Americans we feel, the less connection we feel with each other. And because we get put into these different groups, we start to look at each other like, well, you're in this group. And so uh, I'm not going to listen to you or you're in that group, so I don't have to listen to you. We marginalize each other. And I think a lot of what we see and hear in the news and mainstream media about lives mattering and which lives matter and which lives don't, I just think it's all a crock of bull. I think it's hypocritical. I don't buy it from them one bit. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why I look at it like it's hypocritical. The world doesn't mind calling Christians hypocrites, so I'll just call them hypocrites for a little bit. Because some of the very same people that are in cities tonight in America screaming through a scarf about black lives matter, or if it's a white racist group, it's white lives that matter, or however they're broken up. Some of those very same people are fighting tooth and nail to put an end to, say, capital punishment. But those same people next week will be fighting tooth and nail to keep an abortion clinic open. And so I think to people like that, only some lives matter. I did a little math this week, a little bit of research, and uh, I just did some calculations on the number of American soldiers who have been killed in battle since the American Revolutionary War up until, you know, 2001 to current with the wars we fought in the Middle East. It's about 1.2 million soldiers that have 
have lost their lives. Again, that's all the wars combined. And every year in the United States and Europe, we nearly double that number of deaths through abortion. And that doesn't make sense to me. Because life either matters or it doesn't. And to those of us who follow Christ, we, we not only know him as Savior, but we know him as Lord. We're really following him. We're trying to be like him and live our lives like him. Every life has to matter. Black lives matter. White lives matter. Brown lives matter. All lives matter. And by the way, you will not find people broken up by color and some of those different ways, those different categories, we break up people today. In fact, the only way people are categorized in the scriptures were people who were vulnerable, like widows, orphans, and foreigners. Other than that, people are not broken up based on race. It's not a biblical thing. That's my point. And I'm going to move on, but life must be protected. And for us to protect life, we have to value life. All right, v verse seven. I'll move a little quicker now. As for you, and here in verse seven, God's just re-emphasizing to Noah what he's already said. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons, I am now, or, or I'm sorry, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. Do you get it? All of them. <laughs> I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So what's a covenant? And by the way, covenant, that's an important word in the Bible. A covenant is an agreement. It's like a testament. So you could say that the Old Testament is the old covenant and the New Testament is the new covenant. You have an old, old covenant, new covenant, old agreement, new agreement. Actually, there are a number of covenants that God makes with people in the scriptures. We're, we're gonna encounter a, a couple of more as we go through the book of, of Genesis. Some, sometimes, some, well, what's the best way to explain it? So some covenants, are between two parties where God says, all right, here's what we're gonna do. Like with the, the, um, the covenant on Sinai, God says, I will be your God and you'll be my people. This is what I'll do for you. This is what you do for me. So they have this covenant where both parties, God and Israel, they, they have some responsibilities to, to keep to each other. They have some things they're responsible for. This is not that same kind of covenant. This is God making the covenant all by himself. Noah, nor any of the animals, no, no part of creation, no generation ever has to do anything for this covenant here. God simply says, I am never going to destroy the world with a flood again. Verse 12, and all this ties together. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. So usually when there's, there's a covenant, there's a, a sign that goes with the covenant. There's something for people to look at and say, okay, that reminds me of this agreement that we have. You know, it's kind of like the, the documents you sign. If you buy a house, you sign documents. That's a covenant. You make a, an agreement. You, you know, they're gonna uh, loan you the money to buy the house and you make an agreement to pay it back. And if you ever need to know what the terms of those conditions are, uh, terms and conditions are of the covenant, you just go look at the paperwork. Well, God 
would give similar signs. It's not paperwork, but it's a sign that says, oh yeah, that's a reminder of the covenant. He says in verse 13, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And again, not just for Noah and his family, but for all generations up through now, up through today. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Now, now listen, just, just, just think about why this would be so important. If for no one else, just for the eight people that have survived the flood, Now the earth is not watered from beneath like a subtropical culture. You know, now this membrane in the sky, that's gone. And now it, you know, it's gonna rain like we know rain. It's raining outside right now. I can hear it. I don't know if you can or not, but now there's gonna be rain. And so clouds are gonna gather. Rain is gonna come. Can you imagine if these eight people didn't have the rainbow to look at, can you imagine how this would freak them out? I mean, they would start to think every time clouds came up, every time um, a storm came, every time it started raining, they would wonder, is this where God wipes us all out? And so God says, listen, I'm never gonna do that again. And you already know that I keep my word. He's proven that to them. And he says, listen, I'm gonna put this rainbow in the sky and it'll remind me I can see it too. And you'll be reminded when you see this rainbow that I keep my word that I'm not gonna destroy you through another flood. He says in verse 16, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. So here's the fourth life instruction. Life must be enjoyed. Life must be enjoyed. And there might be a better way of saying that, but I, I couldn't think of a better way of saying it. But really, whether you enjoy it or not, it's really up to you. It's a choice you make. It's a decision that you have to make. And the decision is, am I gonna live according to the truth of scriptures? Am I gonna trust God? Am I gonna trust him to keep his word or not? Because if you trust God and believe what he says in his word and you follow his instructions, there's a promise of care and provision, importance, and value for your life. But if you decide to live your own way, then you're always living in fear. You're always under-resourced in every way. And life is not meant to be lived in fear. Yet I know that some of you watching right now, that's what you're doing. You're, you're living in fear. You're worried about to, what tomorrow holds. You know, Noah and his family, they had similar worries and cares that we have. I mean, there's some differences, but a lot of them are the same. But ultimately, they were able to remember a God who made promises and kept his promises, a God they knew they could trust and depend on. That got them through the hard spots. It got them through the hard, hard, uh, the hard spots up to this point, and, and it'll do the same thing. It'll get them through the hard, tough spots that they encounter for the rest of their lives. And they knew that no matter how things went, God was with them, he would protect them. That they could have peace, they could enjoy life. But outside of that, it's a life of fear, it's a life of unknowing. It's a, it's a life of depending only on yourself. The rainbow, you know, that's really about hope. 
I almost said that life must be hopeful, but that's probably not exactly the way to say it. But I'll tell you, our God is a hopeful God. And, and even in the, in the midst of everything that's happened to this point, even though Noah and his family, they're starting with this, basically a blank canvas, because everywhere you look, man, there's mud. They've got to start from the beginning, but they have hope. They have hope because of God. That's what the rainbow really represents, hope. Some of you are living today without hope and you don't have to. Our God is the God of hope. He's the God that created you. He has a purpose for your life. He wants you to enjoy life. That doesn't mean that everything's always gonna go up and to the right. Doesn't mean that you're always gonna live in the black. But it does mean that you have a God who's with you, that empowers you, that provides for you, that never lets you down. And in every situation, there'll always be hope because there's God. If you're tired of living without hope, if you're tired of living in fear, if you're tired of living a life where you just depend only on yourself, why don't you trade that in today? Why don't you trade that in for a relationship with God? Why don't, why don't you trust him? Just like he saved Noah, he's provided a way of salvation for us. It's not Noah, it's not in an ark, but it's his son Jesus on the cross. Jesus died on the cross, gave his life blood so that our sins could be covered, forgiven, and now through his blood, we have life. We can be forgiven. Our sins can be atoned for. We can be made new. We can start over. Just like Noah and his family were restarting, you can get a restart right here today. You do that when you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you'd like to trust Jesus today, I want to invite you to pray with me. So I want to ask you to bow your head. Close your eyes. If that's appropriate where you are, you might be driving, and so I don't recommend you close your eyes and bow your head. But if you're somewhere where you can bow for prayer, I want you to bow, and I want you to say this prayer with me. You can say it out loud, but you don't have to say it out loud. Our God is the God who searches hearts and minds, and he will hear you when you pray. So let's pray together. Just say this prayer. Jesus, in the best way I know how, I give you my life. I don't know the whole Bible. I don't know as much as I'd like to, but I know that I am a sinner and I need to be saved from my sins. And I'm believing, Jesus, that you are the Savior. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come in my heart and my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I pray that you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. To learn more and more every day what it means to follow you, Jesus. I accept you now as my savior and I commit to follow you as my Lord. Jesus, thank you for loving me and saving me. I pray in your great name, amen. Now listen to me. There's not anything magical about that prayer, but it is supernatural. It is supernatural. The Bible says that when you made the decision to trust Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, that they're throwing a party in heaven. They're rejoicing. The angels are rejoicing in heaven. And isn't that a cool thought? But I want you to understand that this is just the beginning, that there are next steps to take. And here at Rocky River Church, whether you, you live right here in our area, in the greater Charlotte metro area, or you, you live somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world, if you're connecting with us, 
we want to help you take next steps. And so we have a, a book we'd like to get in your hands. It's called Next Steps, and it's about taking next steps in your journey of following Jesus. And we'd like to get you that book. It, it'll be free to you. We just need to know where to send it. So uh, the way to get your free copy of our Next Steps book is just send a text or text the word next steps to the number that you see on your screen. Let me say that again just to make sure I got it right. Just text the word next steps to the number that you see on your screen and we'll get this uh, book out into uh, out of the mail to you this week. And again, we wanna help you take important next steps in being a fully committed, growing follower of Jesus Christ. And hey, listen, if you have questions about your salvation, if, if you are looking for Bible answers, if you just need some encouragement, send us an email. Send us an email to prayer at rockyriverchurch.com. Again, that's prayer at rockyriverchurch.com because we're here to help you. We wanna help you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Once again, thank you for connecting with us today. I love you guys. And listen, more importantly than that, I want you to remember that God loves you and he loves you no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter how long you've been doing it and no matter what's been done to you, you can believe that. That's how God feels about you. God bless you guys. I'll see you soon.